Our point of departure is, uh, is an excellent study by two American professors, Bernatzi and Fela, in the mid-1990s, which appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, where they looked at the long run of uh, U.S. data on uh, returns on the U.S. stock market and U.S. bonds and tried to explain it within a particular uh, psychological paradigm. And we've extended that work, uh, applied it to the U.K. and to some other countries, and we're quite uh, pleased with the sorts of results we've been getting. In the United States, um, where the longest run of high quality data is for equities, we tend to take that as our point of departure for rest of world studies, which may be a bit misleading because the rest of the world markets have not been developed for so long. But standard data from the United States, for instance, suggests that um, back in the first half of the 19th century, equities returned uh, just under 6% per annum in inflation adjusted terms and bonds about 5%. So equities were just a little bit more than bonds. We come through to the 20th century for the most of that period up to about 1990. Um, equities returned over 6% per annum real on average and bonds almost zero. So the gap between equity returns and bond returns had, had uh, increased quite dramatically from the 19th century experience. So Bernatzi and Fehler bring together loss aversion and this mental accounting and they actually present the questions along the following lines. If investors have these loss aversion preferences using parameters of risk aversion which we've seen or loss aversion we've seen from previous experiments and we observe that equities outperform bonds for 6% per annum for long periods of time, is it possible to come up with uh, an evaluation period implied by that uh, set of uh, facts which looks sensible and which might help us actually confirm that this way of thinking about the stock market attitudes to risk and evaluation of different periods of time outcomes is actually a sensible way to go about it. They actually um, come up with a suggestion that the implied period of evaluation is one year to produce an equity risk premium of 6% per annum. And that indeed is what a lot of uh, practical aspects of our financial environment tend to lead us towards. We fill in tax returns once a year. You might talk to your investment advisor at the beginning of a calendar year. So there's an annual pattern to lots of investment decisions naturally occurring. So they suggest that they have found some uh, approach to understanding the attitudes to loss and, uh, and the actual mental evaluation periods, which is consistent with the recent evidence. They then actually ask, well, at a one-year horizon, if people are planning a one-year at a time or evaluating one year at a time their investments, what would be the optimum combination of uh, equities and bonds? And their answer is actually the maximum utility is obtained by a 50-50 split between equities and bonds. That is taken as further confirmation of their uh, insight in that many portfolios in the United States in the last 20 or 30 years of the last century are known to be uh, balanced 50-50. Our contribution in the most recent paper we've written is to look at the long run of UK. Our contribution in the most recent paper we've written is to look at the long run of UK data and repeat that exercise but actually taking the view that rather than looking at the equity risk premium as one number which is constant for 100 years or most of the 20th century, as Bernardi Fehler do, we actually say that's a non-constant number. We have to look at it for different periods of history. So we slice up UK equity returns and bond returns from, nine, from 1803 uh, right away through to 1995. And we slice it up into 20-year periods. And we see some very different behavior. For instance, we see um, from the period from 1936 to 1995, that's when we start getting fairly high equity returns, 8% uh, plus per annum up to 18% plus per annum past 1976. Um, bond returns also raise considerably, particularly after 1976, around 14% per annum. So the equity risk premium in the historical context of the UK is actually around zero, sometimes slightly negative, slightly positive, right the way from the beginning of the 19th century through to 1936. And then things behave quite differently. And we have a significantly larger equity risk premium from the 1936 period, and particularly in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Parallel with that, we also observe for the first time, after 1936, a much higher inflation rate in the retail prices, and a much Lower, in fact, relatively speaking, standard deviation or volatility of inflation. During earlier periods, 
such as uh, 1816 to 1835, we actually observed deflation in the UK. Uh, that appears once or twice more right the way through to the Great Depression um, of 1929 to 1933. Deflation was the order of the day there. So really, since 1936, we have higher equity returns, we have a higher equity risk premium, and we also have higher inflation. What we do in this study is then ask for different periods of time, back to the early 1800s in the UK, what is the optimal asset allocation given the distribution of returns for those 20-year periods? So there are nine 20-year periods in our sample from 1816 through to 1995. And each of those 20-year blocks, we ask if investors evaluated uh, investment outcomes on a one-month, two-month, three-month, one-year, two-year, three-year basis, how would their choice between equities and bonds actually differ? Our answers are that in periods of deflation, uh, bonds tend to dominate quite substantially. In periods of uh, higher inflation, since 1936, equities dominate almost exclusively in many portfolios from many different horizons, from short horizons to the long three-year evaluation horizons. We do that for the UK. We also um, have done similar experiments for um, Australia, for Japan, the United States. And again, the basic message is, if we are living through periods of low inflation or deflation, we can expect investors to actually optimally choose largely bond portfolios. In other words, the distribution of returns for both equities and bonds leads us, because of a large number of negative returns in the equity um, distribution, to actually move much more substantially towards bond portfolios. So that's the first message. If we're moving into an era currently of low inflation or potentially deflation, maybe along the lines of Japan uh, most recently, but certainly in previous eras for the major economies in the 1920s, then we can expect to see bonds having a much greater role to play in optimal asset allocation environments.